Terminator. He's all saddled up on this very cloudy morning here in the Spice Isle. Ready to go. Yes, sir. Today happens to be the fourth day of July. Hey, happy, happy Fourth of July to those of you in the United States. Congratulations on another birthday. Um, I know it's a holiday for uh, most of you folks, and so uh, I do hope that you have a wonderful time and that you're thankful for what you've got. Pilgrims, we're going to begin this morning by taking a look. I mentioned it's a, it's a cloudy morning here, yes, and uh, we'll tell you a little bit about that in just a wee bit. Also in the rundown this morning, Peter David is reaching out to Grenada's diaspora in the United Kingdom. And we also have another brief update for you on... Uh, the matter between the government of Grenada and uh, WRB Enterprises, or Grand Lake, if you will. And we do have the national report, but um, I think we're going to hold off on the national report until uh, later on in the program, because I want to be on time getting Mr. B on here this morning. Mr. B is here. We're going to let him loose right after our introductory session, if you will. Okay? Now... Let's get into today's rundown and see what we got cooking here. First of all, my dear friends, assuming that the National Hurricane Center is correct today and tomorrow could be quite soggy. Apparently, there's a well-defined tropical wave to the east of us, which is forecast to impact the Caribbean Thursday and Friday. That's today and tomorrow bringing enhanced shower and thunderstorm activity with gusty winds. And according to the Trinidad and Tobago Weather Center, severe weather is likely. I still haven't heard anything from the Met Office here in Grenada or NADMA, but um, we are keeping an eye on the satellite pictures. And from what I saw just a little bit uh, ago, yeah, I, I do expect that it's going to be really cloudy and overcast all day. But from what I saw within the last few minutes, it seems like this system seems to be dissipating uh, a little bit. All right. Now, the following should be of interest to Grenadians residing in the UK. Grenada Minis Grenada's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Peter David, will be visiting Britain from July 5th, that's tomorrow, through the 11th on state business, which includes a meeting with Grenadians in the diaspora, okay? The meeting with UK-based nationals will take place on Sunday, the 7th, from 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and that's going to be held at the Acton Vale Community Centre in London. This will be the Minister's first official engagement in the final phase of the implementation of a formally structured relationship between Grenada and its diaspora communities. Hmm. In this latest exercise, the Grenada government is receiving support from the UN International Office of Migration, known as the IOM, for a diaspora mapping component of the outreach. The aim of the mapping is to learn more about the socio-economic profile of the Grenadian diaspora in Europe, North America, and the Caribbean. The goal is to harness the skills of Grenadians in the diaspora to facilitate a matching to areas where there is a lack of that particular skill in Grenada, Cariacou, and Petty Martinique. Mr. David, said, Mr. David says that coming out of numerous consultations which have taken place since, 19, uh, since 2008, staff at the Office of Diaspora Affairs has partnered with the IOM to provide technical assistance which would allow Grenada to document the skills, abilities, and qualifications of Grenadians resident in the diaspora, and that one of the avenues for achieving this objective is through the launch of a website which will provide for conducting an online survey. 
I quote here, going forward, he added, the website will also serve as an ongoing conduit between Grenadians at home and in the diaspora, especially as a one-stop shop for up-to-date relevant information and coordination of all diaspora activities." Unquote. He also point, uh, provided the assurance that the team will be reaching out to you in the upcoming months to continue discussions on what you want to see, how you would like to contribute, and how you can be supported in your efforts at helping your beloved nation. According to the International Office of Migration, at once the this phase of the Grenada Initiative to engage, enable, and empower the diaspora with the ultimate aim of fostering a transfer of the diaspora's human, social, economic, and cultural capital in order to make the diaspora a true partner in the development of Grenada. That's a statement that was issued yesterday by uh, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Now, further to the government of Grenada's press release on Wednesday, the 26th of June, on the matters in dispute between the government of Grenada and WRB Enterprises, the government issued a release yesterday afternoon which says as follows. In 2016, I'm quoting here for you, in 2016, after coordination with international consultants and local electricity sector stakeholders, the government passed the new Electricity Supply Act and Public Utilities Regulatory Commission Act. These acts liberalized Grenada's electricity sector, ended the monopoly on electricity generation, and established effective regulatory control over the sector. The liberalization of the sector and the passage of the legislation were implemented as part of overarching structural reforms initiated and funded by the World Bank through the Eastern Caribbean Energy Regulatory Authority Project, better known as ECERA, E-C-E-R-A. The release went on to say, that following the 2016 reforms, WRB, the US-based majority shareholder of Grenlick, initially demanded that the government repurchase its shares in the company for 65 million US dollars plus interest. In May of 2017, WRB and its local subsidiary GPP, Grenada Private Power, initiated an international arbitration against the government seeking the compelled repurchase of the shares on the basis of the 1994 share purchase agreement. WRB's demand has since been revised upward to 182 million EC dollars plus interest. And that's the equivalent to approximately 67 million US dollars plus interest. Yesterday's government statement ended by saying that in June of 2019, WRB and the government concluded a hearing in front of an international arbitration tribunal 
at the World Bank's International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. That tribunal will rule on whether, and if so, at what price, the government must repurchase WRB shares. The tribunal's decision has not yet been issued and is expected in the coming months. Meanwhile, government's policy remains that Grenlex shares should be held or purchased by private sector interests. Folks, text of a statement issued yesterday by the Government Information Service. And so, it's now 11 minutes after 9 o'clock. I did, I had the goal to actually promise this gentleman. See that gentleman sitting up there? I actually, and he's not wearing a t-shirt this morning, he's, he's dressed up in shirt this morning. No tie, but he's dressed up in shirt. Anyhow, I promised him that we would get to him at 9.15 this morning. I ain't messing with this man. I'm going to try and keep my promise. So, what I'm going to do right now is take our first little break, and then we will come on back with Mr. Alan Bajinski. This summer, make your dreams a reality with a Co-op Bank Summer Scissor Loan. Get up to $20,000 and qualify for a chance to win a staycation at Silver Sands. Go on a vacation, enjoy the carnival season, have your dream wedding, or make home improvements. Make this summer sizzle with everything you want it to be. Visit your nearest retail banking unit for more details. Special terms and conditions apply. Conveniently located in the Grand Anne Shopping Center, for over 40 years, Food Fair has provided quality service at affordable prices. Now, grocery shopping is made easier and more convenient from the Food Fair web store. Hey, babe. Hmm? Listen, uh, I need you to go down to Food Fair to get some groceries. All right, no problem. Right away. Thanks, babe. What are you doing? You're supposed to be going to Food Fair to get a grocery man. I am. But didn't you know you can order your groceries online from the Food Fair web store? Are you serious? Of course. All you have to do is just to log on to www.foodfair.gd with credit card in hand. And with an order of $100 or more, Food Fair Granans will deliver up to three miles away. And you don't even have to worry about your information, you know. The safety measures are excellent. So hold on. You just order online and Food Fair will deliver to you? Yep. Oh, baby, better hurry up and order, man. <laughs> I already did. They should be here any minute now. Enjoy easy online shopping anytime from your home or office from the Food Fair web store. Food Fair, where you can fill your baskets without emptying your pockets. Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates. 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and their 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com when you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. Alrighty, folks, after our first break, let's say good morning to Fitzroy, and he remembers it's 4th of July. Happy 4th of July to those of you in the United States. And John Bruno is also saying good morning to Mr. B. Pedro, hello there, Pedro. We'll be in touch with you real soon. And Dennis Charles is also saying good morning and asking us to keep up the good works. Thanks a lot, Dennis. Um, Arthur Langine is saying uh, <laughs> good morning, Brother George and Brother A.B. Happy 4th of July, and I'm waiting to hear what he has to say. Aren't we all? Well, we're going to wait no longer. Let's say good morning to Mr. Alan Bozinski. How are you, sir? Good morning. I am depressed. Ouch. Oh, boy. At the manner in which our standards are under attack, at the manner in which we seem to 
accept a deterioration in civility in the manner of our communications, in the manner in which lies are disseminated by the authorities. And we seem to have difficulty in standing up for accepted norms of behavior. Now, you remember some time ago, we addressed the behavior of Simple Simon and his hitman sidekick with regard to a matter concerning water quality. Um, subsequently, I think in the last week, a video has been making the rounds of a section of pipe I saw that. that has to be replaced by Nawasa. So far, so good. What really has distressed me is the voice over. Now, here you have a video with evidence of the buildup of deposits of some sort in a main line or a pipe, a branch line, whatever it is, which is used to deliver potable water. That is P-O-T-A-B-L-E, potable, not portable, which for some reason is pronounced the same way, which again speaks to this deterioration in standards and norms. Nevertheless, the voiceover really wasn't necessary. And I'm sorry that the people who are forwarding the video were not able to remove the audio. Because the individual who was describing what he was seeing and uh, apparently referring to the origin of the pipe seems not to have benefited from education. And instead of being able to use adjectives, was reduced to a repeated use of obscenities in order to describe what, frankly, is a dirty pipe. It is a disgrace, not because of the waste of educational resources on the particular individual voicing the audio, but it is a disgrace that anybody should be forwarding this without having tried to delete the audio. To add to my disappointment, the Grenada Broadcasting Network apparently took some footage of, I think I saw it written, some tiny tots in Hermitage. All I can say is I don't know who is in charge of programming at the Grenada Broadcasting Network. It was difficult to establish because I received the, the video clip from somebody in the United States without any comment. So I don't know whether they were amused or whether they were as distressed as I am. The clip appears to be recording an activity taking place with some tiny tots. Whether this is in a preschool, a kindergarten, a daycare, I don't know. But they are dressed up, the first group, in what appeared to be representations of police personnel. Then another group is dressed up in representations of maybe the fire service. The interviewer thrust a microphone in front of one tiny tot and says, you are dressed as a police officer. Why do you want to be a police officer? And the tiny tot responded along the lines of to jail people and shoot people. 
I thought that the interviewer might have used the opportunity to suggest that the role of the RGPF is to serve and protect, to maintain law and order, and to keep us safe, not to jail people and shoot them. And I don't know where the tiny tot got that sort of idea that this is what police are for. Then the interviewer moved on to the group that appeared to be dressed in firemen's outfits and inquired from one of the tiny tots, what are you dressed up as? And the tiny tot responded to the effect that it was his mother. Now I'm not certain as to whether or not his mother is a fireman or whether he did not understand the simple English question, what are you dressed up as? But his response was, me mora. Well, I sympathize with the teachers who have to try and breach this language barrier. But it also explains to me why when these tiny tots are so disadvantaged that in response to a simple question, the, res the, the, the answer given had nothing to do with the question. But the two words, mi mora, explains to me why this tiny tot or these tiny tots or a lot of people, when they grow up, similarly to the audio on the video of the Nawasa pipe, most of what you hear coming from their mouths are along the lines of you murder this and you murder that. So at the tiny touch stage, this is where it starts, I believe. Me murder. Now, going on from this issue, what is, as I say, I continue to be disappointed and depressed. I listened to a gentleman who I believe has a contract with the Ministry of Youth or something, one ambassador, and he was saying on the radio yesterday that $2 million a month is being spent on youth programs. Now, this individual has a contract, he's working in the public service, and he's of, as far as I know, his background is that he was a youth organizer for a political party. The frightening thing is that $2 million a month is being spent in programs which ostensibly are under his immediate supervision. It is staggering. Along the same lines, the announcement was made that certain school vouchers are now available. This is to help the, the parents who have children and they are unable to properly, presumably unable to properly feed and clothe them for them to go to school. So they are to collect their school vouchers in their districts and again, complete absence of any adherence to standards. A government program is being administered through, wait for it, you won't be surprised, party political offices. We are all taxpayers because of the value added tax. And we all should object to the fact that these social programs are indistinguishable from party political activities. I think it is a disgrace. Now, you read a press release, and let me tell you about another disgrace. Grenleck is perfectly able, and I'm sure will respond to this latest piece of deliberate obfuscation and misinformation coming from the propaganda arm of the 
ministerial complex on the fifth floor. And it bears repeating that Grenlec has 51,000 customers at the end of 2018. Those customers, by and large, have been provided with an excellent service. In and in particular, when you compare our service with the rest of the region, that is, those OECS countries which are supposedly part of the Eastern Caribbean Energy Regulatory Authority project, ISERA. I would jump immediately to the situation in Antigua when the generating of electricity is done by a company owned by a single family. The transmission and distribution is operated by the government of Antigua. That single family has in the past had to withhold the electricity supply from the government of Antigua in order to get the government's indebtedness settled. The situation in Antigua with regard to electricity supply and regulation is not of the best. I think history records that following the privatization of, of the electricity environment here in 1994, that after the government changed, that the shareholders, the share purchase agreement was scrutinized and approved, validated, accepted, whatever it is. But according to the press release in 2016, after coordination with international consultants and local electricity sector stakeholders, the government passed the new Electricity Supply Act and Public Utilities Regulatory Commission Act. We had a Public Utilities Commission legislation in place for years. As a matter of fact, the non-fuel charge, which was part of the share purchase agreement and was subject to review by the Public Utilities Commission. That non-fuel charge increased by three cents in 24 years. The situation became so ridiculous that when Grenlec would apply for adjustments in the non-fuel charge, that in the absence of any response from the Public Utilities Commission, they would then reduce the charge and on more than one occasion i believe did not implement increases which were entitled to them under the agreement for the, the um under the formula they had for increases so it is laughable in my view that all of a sudden you are hearing that, let me quote it, that um, the government is suddenly interested in establishing effective regulatory control. Since 2016, they have done nothing about meeting their own responsibilities under this act. And with regard to government policy that Grenlec shares should be held or purchased by private sector interests, Grenlec shares are traded on the OECS stock market. Grenlec shares are held 29% by private individuals 
21% by government and the NIS between them, and the balance held by Grenada Private Power, a locally registered entity under this act, incorporated entity, the majority shares of which are held by WRB, 21%. So, I, as I said, I'm going to leave Grenlec to respond to this latest piece of propaganda. They are, they are capable of defending themselves. But as I said, it is depressing. And the timing in 2016, I just want to remind everybody that this was around the time when one investor, Charles Liu, was going to set up a mini city in Mount Hartman and was going to require 15 megawatts of electricity generating capacity. At the time, that would have been about one third of Grenlex installed capacity. So I am drawing a link here between the sudden passage of that act in 2016 and the announcement that Charles Liu was going to set up this mini city in Mount Hartman. Well, the mini city in Mount Hartman hasn't happened. Charles Liu is not happening. And this legislation having been passed has not taken effect. And Grenlec continues to provide electricity and long may they continue to do so. I'm waiting to hear you say, I done. I done. Mr. Bajinski, thank you very much for raising all of the issues that you raised this morning. I want to comment on uh, at least one of them because uh, once again, you were right on the money. Let's start with the matter of that Nawasa pipe. I know the piece you're talking about. It's a video with a gentleman holding up a pipe and showing a lot of deposits that had formed on the inside of that pipe. Mr. B, I have uh, a couple of WhatsApps accounts. And because of the language, or the way I felt that the public really need to see the deposits that appeared in that pipe, because of the language that was used, I did not post it on my, uh, my public forum. I do have an SWGG forum there. But I thought, you know, I'm sure that this one is going to ruffle Alan's feathers. And you were right. Yeah. So I sent it to you. And you responded. Your response had to do with the fact that uh, a disclaimer pertaining to parental guidance or I don't remember the exact wording, but you explicit content, explicit content. That was that was your response. Absolutely correct. And again, rather than put up the picture, or put up that video on the public forum um, and uh, the disclaimer, I thought, don't bother. But Alan, what bothered me even more, and by the way, thank you for raising that point about the disclaimer, um, but I felt that I could share that with you. Alan, what bothered me more was the images of those deposits in that pipe. Alan, in the absence of having done any clinical tests on those deposits, that bothered me because it raised concerns about distinctly possible health hazards. Could you imagine, Alan, opening your tap in the morning knowing that that water you're putting in your mouth could be coming through something as contaminated 
contaminated as that? Scary stuff, Mr. B. Yep, I think I've said before that you need to boil your water. Well, you know. <laughs> or better yet, distill it. It's, it's scary. It was scary, Alan. Anyhow, then you turn to the matter of WRB. Alan, I am eagerly awaiting Grenelec's response to that release, which again, as soon as I saw this yesterday afternoon, I shared it with you because I know that you, I don't know if you still are, but I know that you were on uh, the board of directors of Grenelec at one time. Am I correct? Um, Ambrose Philip and myself on two occasions, actually, when the government forgot to send in a proxy. But um, wh while you're at it, as you talk about the board of directors, I did refer to the percentage shares held by the respective shareholders. Now, the 29% held by the small shareholders, over 1,600 of them, um, they, you, you're not going to get them coming to a meeting an annual shareholders meeting. So over the years, what has happened, as long as the government sends in their proxy, it means that their nominees get onto the board. And so the idea in the original share purchase agreement of providing some input um, or the opportunity, providing the opportunity for input by the smaller shareholders has been lost because the government has every year um, nominated four people, in spite of the fact that they are guaranteed one representative who current for the last few years has been an employee of the National Insurance Board. But in addition, they have Ashton Frame, Bert Braffitt, Winifred Duncan Phillip, and Cleaver Williams, who I'm sure are very decent, upstanding individuals in their own right. But I'm not entirely sure what their qualifications are to represent the interests of the 1,600 small shareholders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a note here. You want me to repeat the names? <laughs> Ashton Frame, Bert Braffitt, Winifred Duncan Phillip, and Cleaver Williams. I, is Mr. Brathwaite, uh, that's Dr. Brathwaite, isn't it? He's also on the gravel and concrete, if I'm not mistaken? Last I heard, yes. Okay. Uh, but um, but I, I would think that he has certain, uh, another more um, important qualification, both him and Ashton. <laughs> uh, I ain't going there. Uh, um, Peter Bishop says, I expect Grenelec to win the matter before the tribunal. Have you seen the two pieces that were published uh, recently on the GrenadaBroadcast.com website and I would imagine elsewhere? Um, I'm, I'm not sure which, but you see, it's not, it's not the issue so much of, of Grenelec being successful because the tribunal is merely to determine the award to be made. There can't be that much difference, whether it's 165 million EC or 185 million EC. To me, that is neither here nor there. The issue is that government has breached the share purchase agreement, and I believe that no, if we if if we see a change in the ownership of Grenleck. We are, we are not likely to see a continuation of the standard of service and the improvements. No, for example, in the last three years, Grenleck has a program of renewables with the interconnection with individuals with solar panels, small system generation. They've, they've had some larger ones, and they have been doing some of this themselves. But in the absence of a functioning regulatory environment, they are not going to continue to invest. When I was on the board of Grenlec, we were looking at feasibility studies for geothermal exploration. 
nothing has happened in some years. And in the interim, you have four individuals appointed, elected, not appointed, elected by the shareholders, who it, on the face of it, one would have to say they're doing the government's bidding. And you have another director who is appointed. So they've got five on the board. And it seems that we're not making progress because the regulatory environment, the so-called public utilities regulatory authority is not functioning. So it looks as though um, Grenlock is being left to continue to do the same old, same old, but they are not going to have the opportunity to expand and develop as we would expect, particularly in the area of putting up renewable generation or generation of electricity from renewable sources. Yep. Solar, geothermal, wind, etc. You know, A.B., uh, when I came back to Grenada in 1986, I remember uh, what the load shedding was like here. I was uh, managing a radio station called Radio Grenada back in those days. And those, uh, 7.30 every morning, I had to sit with a long list for about 15, 20 minutes and read the places, names of places that were going to be affected by power outages because of load shedding. And I think... You remember, I, you remember, you remember who was the general manager then? Me? No, of Grand Lake. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But of course, but of course. But Alan, you know, I think a lot, when people think about Grand Lake, they think about the impact that this whole thing could have on uh, the quality of service, electricity service. But Alan, the part that really gets to me is that it goes way beyond that. Because there are so many community organizations in this country who are scrunting to try and provide services to their community and to this nation. And a lot of them have relied heavily on Grand Lake's outreach through its community development program. Don't remember the exact name of the program right now. But that too has now ceased. Alan, it's causing a lot of agony for a lot of people. And that's something that needs not be forgotten. Well, again, um, I was at a forum where many of the individuals who have benefited from this community outreach were present. But I have to say that um, a couple of the more outspoken ones were outspoken in support of government. Hello? Which, which, which suggests to you that they don't fully understand the issues that are involved. Yeah. Yeah. That's another story, Alan. That's another story. Mr. B, um, we're running out of time, but uh, quickly want to jump at a couple of things here. First of all, Something that I know has been a nemesis for Alan Brzezinski, the uh, derelict vehicles in this country. Huh? Yeah, he's <laughs> laughing. He's la but I'm glad that I'm able to put a smile on your face this morning because your demeanor... Yeah, yeah to, to, to get through my depression, yeah. Yeah, your demeanor this morning is not the type of demeanor I've come to expect from Mr. Brzezinski, and I understand why. But Mr. B... I am extending an invitation to you, and I really hope I get this done by Sunday, to join us on Sunday morning for Sundays with George Grant. Why? A couple of days ago, Mr. B, um, a couple of us, a gentleman by the name of uh, Mandu Seals and Ian Blakey, they're both with something called the Grenada Green Group. Yep. These gentlemen, they promised me a long time ago that they would take me on an island tour to see some of the damage that's being done to this country environmentally. And while we did not intend to spend much time taking a look for derelict vehicles. It's right in your face. Oh, gosh, Alan. Alan, 
we have got some video that will make you wet your diapers on Sunday. No, 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 because very little of what you have recorded is news to me because I drive around the island there. relatively frequently. Yeah, it's pathetic, Alan. It is pathetic. Well, the rest of the country is going to see that on, uh, on Sunday. Finally, sir, you know that one of the thorns in my side has been uh, the weather forecasting and weather reporting that takes place or does not take place in this country. Uh -huh. uh, I put something up on the website yesterday about uh, an alert from the National Hurricane Center about a tropical wave which was east of us. And uh, by the way, there are several tropical waves out there in the Atlantic right now, and they're warning that uh, there could be a biggie coming off Africa, the African coast next week. Okay, so uh -huh. things, things are starting to heat up. But anyhow, they were saying that there was this wave just east of the Lesser Antilles that could affect us today. Alan, even as I sit here talking to you, I still haven't heard a word from NADMA nor the Met Office at the Maurice Bishop Airport. And Alan, that alert talked about the possibility of heavy rains, thunderstorms, uh, and high winds, and I have not heard a beep. And then... Well, actually, on the news last night, at the end of the news last night on GBN, I um, did see that there would be, during the later part of today, the possibility of thunder showers. I don't recall the high wind, but um, I will refer you to the daily tips from NADMA along the lines of, you if it's those. going to rain, if it's going to rain and you're in a low-lying area, you should expect flooding. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Alan. Actually, have you, have you seen your daily tip from the PRO of NADMA today? I, yes, sir. I get them and I try to glance over them as quickly as possible because I have gone to serious hurricane uh, preparedness sites and I have been disseminating information about preparedness. I mean, the stuff that I see coming out of there, it's just laughable. Laughable. Anyhow, that's another story. <laughs> Mr. B, thank you for your Thursday morning jaunt. Uh, we'll keep in touch about Sunday. And uh, you have a good day, sir. And, and I would just like to express my commiserations to the Royal Grenada Police Force that having had a successful Police Week 2019, that tiny tots in Hermitage believe that police are there to jail people and shoot them. Yeah, isn't that pathetic, sir? I forgot to get to that one, but that is sad. That is, and it speaks volumes about uh, standard of education and parenting in this place. Not just education, but parenting as well. Take care, man. And the effectiveness of the $2 million a month, presumably under the stewardship of the former youth ambassador for a political party. Yeah. Yes, sir. Help us. Yeah. Keep praying, sir. Keep praying. <laughs> okay? Take care, Abby. Uh, Let's see. All right, folks. Alan Pashinsky. Whoa. Not a pretty picture. Not a pretty picture. Let me take a little break, and we'll come back. Ah. Come back with a national report after this. So uh, hang in there for just a wee bit. A natural disaster can change your life in minutes. Preparation is the best protection for your family and business. Prepare now. Create a disaster plan and make sure everyone knows what to do. Store water, non-perishable food, and medication. Remember basic emergency supplies such as batteries and flashlights. Trim overhanging trees. If trees near power lines are unsafe to trim, call Grenlec at 237 for assistance or advice. 
Install surge protectors to safeguard your electrical devices against outages and intermittent surges. For more information, visit Grenlec.com. Grenlec, energizing our Grenada. Marisha, I've been a confectionery maker 16 years now. Well, as a child growing up, my grandmom always always make fudge and always make any candies, cakes, as I remember, and I always have an interest in that, you know? It's like when I'm in the kitchen, I'm very happy. If you're making coconut fudge, you put the kids just grate the coconut, you squeeze the milk, and then you strain it, then you add your sugar, and then you put it to boil. And then after when you reach a certain stage, you get thick. So you got to beat it. Then after when you beat it, you pour it out, so, and then wait for a few minutes and it get hard, and then you, you slice it, you cut it, and then after you break it up and then you package it. Yeah. Providing food for 16 years now. I remember when I, I just go dropping in the foot, I was a bit younger too, and I met Miss Harris. So I went and I said, you know, I have a product here, some fudge. I was wondering if you'll be interested to take some fudge or candies from me. I showed her, she said, you look very nice, you know? So she said, I'll try it. So she told me to bring back some another, another day. So which I, that's when I started, but Miss Harris took it from me, and then they would start, so you know? I had a good relationship with them. Of course, I felt special, you know, at least somebody taking my thing local and, you know, other people can see it because if it's, I just have it, you know, much people come, a lot of people comes in, they're foreigners. So it, it was kind of special, you know, and especially when I go in there, all the workers, it's very nice to me. If I pass and they say, um, this, um, Kitty, you bringing anything this week for the thing finished? You know, they always look out for me. That's what I like. The atmosphere is nice in there. My name is Kitty Marisho. I work with Food Fair to provide you with sweet treats. Welcome to Heads Meeting in St. Lucia to discuss pressing economic development matters. Details to this story and more in the National Report. With the details to the news for Wednesday, July 3rd, I am Rakesha St. Louis. The implementation of measures to enhance the CSME, an interim report from the CARICOM Commission on the Economy and the Situation in Venezuela and Blacklisting. These are some of the main agenda items for the fourth year regular meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community, which was officially opened in St. Lucia on Wednesday. Prime Minister Dr. The Right Honorable Keith Mitchell is attending the meeting, accompanied by the Honorable Oliver Joseph, Minister for Trade, Industry, Cooperatives and CARICOM Affairs. The meeting was addressed by the incoming CARICOM Chairman, Prime Minister Alan Chastney of St. Lucia, outgoing Chairman, Prime Minister Dr. Timothy Harris of St. Kitts and Nevis, and CARICOM Secretary General, Ambassador Owen LaRock. Progress in advancing the CSME must be on the bedrock of a safe and secure economy. Concerns about crime and security have a common thread throughout the member states. We have been making every effort at the regional level to enhance our cooperation and to put in place a security architecture to combat the scourge. An important feature of that architecture are the legal instruments which have been agreed, but which are still awaiting more signatures to come into force. Following on the special summit on security this May, this meeting will receive proposals aimed at deepening security cooperation in addressing transnational and domestic crime. 
we must be prepared legally and operationally to defy those who are intent on disrupting our society and destroying our way of life. The threats to our society are not only posed by crime and security. The blacklisting of some of our member states and associate members as non-cooperative tax, tax jurisdictions is a clear and direct threat to the economic well-being of those countries. Our member states have a sovereign right to determine their fiscal policy. Our compliance with the regulatory measures and standards for tax transparency set by the OECD, the recognized global authority, is being dis disregarded by others. The arbitrary impositions of rules by countries and groups of countries other than the OECD with respect to, with respect to tax governance and anti-money laundering without meaningful consultation with the affected states is unacceptable. Public investment and appraisal management, the focus of a three-day training for public sector planning officers organized by the World Bank. The training highlights the importance of strengthening capacity among planning units in formulating ideas and proposals for government and ministerial projects and programs. The training will remedy gaps within the public service that have led to the increase in failure to implement several projects following approval by local and outside agencies. Lead facilitator from Duke Scanford Center for International Development, Fernando Fernholz, says the workshop places emphasis on the feasibility of projects even before they are approved for funding. The objectives are to uh, make sure that people um, uh, can uh, formulate uh, projects in a better fashion such that the proposals that then reach the higher level authorities have enough of analysis and uh, enough elements for them then to judge which are the best projects for the country. Participants Siobhan Brittany and Camille St. Louis are confident the training will bear fruits in ensuring that going forward, better managed, viable projects and programs are implemented. This particular training is geared towards the planning officers, mostly and project officers involved in the various ministries to improve their knowledge and capabilities in the area of appraisals and um, management of, 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 of projects and so on. We want to ensure that the projects that we implement are good projects and that when they're implemented that they are followed through the way they're supposed to and, and, they, and that they achieve the desired objectives at the end of the day. To ensure that the projects that are um, added to the PSIP are really feasible, viable projects um, that can be implemented successfully and so um, promote economic development. The training ends on Thursday, July 4th. This is the National Report. We'll have more news after the break. Every summer, the Spice Island of Grenada is transformed into the Caribbean's biggest party, Spice Man. Coming down to Grenada. Come experience the warmth of our people, trending team fats, the revelry, the pageantry, and why we are the Jab Nation. The kids, our future shines on August 3rd in the Children's Carnival Frolic and the Junior Calypso Show. Seven beauties take set to stage as the Queen of Carnival is crowned on majestic Thursday, August 8th. The prestigious Soka and Groovy Monarchs are crowned on Carnival Friday night, August 9th. Enjoy the pulsating rhythms of the still pan at the Junior and the Senior panorama on Carnival Saturday August 10th and Real Steel August 17th. The March Gras crowns the Calypso Monarch on Carnival Sunday August 11th. Two days of frolicking in the Caribbean sun kicks off on Monday morning August 12th with the biggest, biggest juve in the world. Followed by pageant and Monday Night Mass. The creativity and splendor of our mass parades on the road Carnival Tuesday, August 13th. Join us in the Jab Nation of Grenada, August 8th to 12th for Spice Mass 2019. Many events, one carnival. Welcome back. Grenadians on mainland and in Kariku have been benefiting from free IK clinics as part of the annual visit by ophthalmologists from Vosch International. The Vosch International consists of a team of volunteer opticians and healthcare providers who have been providing free IK clinics to Grenadians for the past seven years. The free clinic started on June 29th in Kariku. The team then journeyed to St. Patrick, St. Andrew and St. George. Past the president of Grenada Rotary Club, Julia Lawrence, says for the past week, over 900 individuals were assessed. The last few days, they have been very busy. Um, yesterday, they would have seen that it would have been in um, 
Grand Bra. They would have seen in excess of 300. I think it's 366 persons. On Monday in um, Satez, they would have um, seen in the vicinity of 300. And in Karakou, they would have seen in the vicinity of, I think, 266 persons in Karakou. So we've been very busy over the last three days of this project. The numbers have been increasing over the years. This morning, we had a massive turnout here. Um, we have registered to date, at this time, we have registered 358 persons. We had to turn away quite a large number of persons because, I mean, there are so many persons that the team can see. Services include eye testing and prescription of medication. Eye testing, they pro they're providing medication, they're providing glasses, they're providing um, shades if they need them. Um, to the extent that they have the medication, they would get the medication. In the past, we have done surgeries. Um, we're not doing any surgeries this year. Um, there is no telling when next we would do surgery, but if persons are recommended, then once they have that referral, the next time surgeries come around, um, they could uh, yes. Finally, 20 male residents of Her Majesty's Prison are now part of a new program which aids in rehabilitation and self-development that can eventually reintegrate them into society. The nine-month adult and teen challenge program was officially opened by her, the Governor General, Her Excellency Dame Cecile Lagrenade, on Wednesday with repetition of offences by those who were incarcerated being one of the major concerns over the years, the implementation of the program is expected to have lasting positive effects. Her Excellency is contented with the launch of the new program since the opportunity presented to make a change is necessary. The rehabilitation of offenders is the best means of ensuring a safer society by providing them with the opportunity to reflect on and take responsibility for their crimes and wrongdoings, and also to prepare, prepare them for a law-abiding life when they are released. Rehabilitation will provide, among other things, access to many areas of training, affording the prisoners the opportunity to become employed after serving their prison term. Having and keeping a job with a source of income can change people's lives. It is only by prioritizing rehabilitation that we can reduce reoffending and, in turn, the number of future victims of crime. Today, I would like to commend the Prime Minister and the Ministry of National Security, the Commissioner of Prisons, and his staff for this initiative, which will undoubtedly support offenders, encourage them to do the right thing, and hopefully convince them to turn their backs on crime for good. The program, which initially began in the United States, is conducted in 125 countries worldwide in 1,500 centers. Norbert Chanel's director of the Global Teen Challenge for Latin America and the Caribbean, expressed how happy he is to be a part of the Grenada program. Your Excellency, Commissioner, Ministers, we are taking men who society said, and women, that you're not useful. But I know all of you, you have usefulness in your heart. And we're taking what society says useless and making useful men and women down the road. And I thank God for this opportunity. And we will be praying for you. We continue to commit our team to you. Early rehabilitation programs implemented with the Her Majesty's Prison, such as Project REACH, has shown positive results over the years, with over 80% of inmates not being remanded to prison recurrently. The program has been guided by the theme, Putting Hope Within REACH. That story just ended the national report for Wednesday, July 3rd. Let's recap the top story. CARICOM heads meeting in St. Lucia to discuss pressing economic development matters. On behalf of everyone here at the Government Information Service who made this newscast possible, I am Rakesha St. Louis saying thank you for joining us. Until next time. And on that note, my dear friends, we're going to bring the curtain down on today's edition of Good Day Grenada, but not without.
sharing a parting word with you. Today it comes from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 to 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Encouraging, to say the least. Isaiah 40, verses 28 to 31. On that note, my dear friends, we're going to pull the curtain down on this morning's edition. Uh, good day, Grenada. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope you don't get too wet today. By God's grace, let's get together again tomorrow morning. Oh, by the way, tonight, 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 another edition. Yes, sir. Mequi chat with the usual suspects. 8 o'clock. We expect that Bev and Margaret and Catherine and Jerry and probably Arthi and Dominica and Dwyer and St. Kitts, we all hang out here tonight at 8 o'clock. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.